The American Geophysical Union is a robust global network of scientists working across disciplines in Earth and space science. And the fall meeting is the most influential event in the world dedicated to the advancement of Earth and space sciences. And AGU-TV is here to cover it all. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Laura Krantz, your host for this thrilling third day of AGU-TV. We have so much in store as more than 25,000 attendees from more than 100 countries converge to share research and network. Today's focus will be on art and innovation, and we will talk to leaders in the field blazing their own trails. We sit down with Dr. Lucy Jones and hear how she is using music as a call to action on climate change. And we take you out of this world with a focus on one of the most fascinating missions in space, Dragonfly. There will be something for everyone, and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You'll be able to find all the latest episodes and content of AGU TV on the in-house channels of our partner hotels, on our dedicated page on the AGU website, and of course, always on our Twitter and YouTube channels. Plenty of ways to watch. Today, we start everything off with a blast off. When it comes to innovation, SSAI has been a leader for the past 40 years. And now, SSAI scientists and engineers are involved with one of the planet's most fascinating missions in space, Dragonfly, NASA's attempt to explore Titan, Saturn's largest moon. Geophysical sciences are really uh, an incredibly exciting time uh, in history because uh, we do have these uh, increasing capabilities in uh, space uh, observation, remote sensing, and uh, Science Systems and Applications Incorporated uh, is a 45-year-old company that has operating in the field of geophysics uh, uh, without interruption. SSCI scientists and engineers support uh, a lot of missions uh, from ISA2 to, uh, they work in geodesy and in a mesoscale, in climate and radiation, and also, of course, data simulation and modeling. Most uh, recent is uh, the contribution to uh, the mission Dragonfly. Dragonfly is really trying to answer some of these really important questions that we have as humans. You know, are we alone in the universe? And also, how alone are we? You know, what, what we learn at Dragonfly might uh, change the way we ask that question. There is a tremendous amount of potential for cross-fertilization. We are expanding our knowledge and our understanding of the universe in which we live. Dr. Kiki Jenkins is a marine sustainability scientist at Arizona State University. She's also a science dance choreographer, and she joined us in studio to talk about the intersection of science and dance. Thank you for coming in today to talk to us. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, so tell me a little bit about Psydance. I'm fascinated by this because it seems like such a creative way to reach out to students and the general public and non-science people. Mm -hmm. So Psydance is a program I have that uses dance to express science concepts. And it's a participatory process, so I actually work with adults who may not be dancers themselves to create movement that to them embodies the science concepts they've just learned about. Um, it's something that began when I did the AAAS Dance Your PhD competition this first year and I won second place in the postdoctoral category. And it really became clear to me how powerful dance was and the reactions of people, not just immediately, but 10 years afterwards, it was still having impact on folks. Yeah, so you know, connecting thought to movement and trying to, I mean, is it interpretive dance? Is it chore choreographed? Is it, how do, how do you come up with the dances? Is it sort of what people, like I can envision seaweed and kind of dancing that way, but like how do you marry those two things? There's three tools. So sometimes I have short little ex exercises. They're just 10, 15 minutes with the audience. Other times I have two hours to build out a dance. There are um, in the moment interpretive movements where I might say to someone, what does the ocean mean to you? Just give me words. Give me words. What does the ocean mean to you? Uh, blue, clean, flowing, life. Ah, okay. Blue, clean, flowing life. So if I said flowing to you and I asked you to move your body with flowing, in any way that means flowing to you, maybe just your hand, what does, what does that look it's like? It's sort of like this. It's like this. Yeah. So I might take that and then I would say, can we move this the whole body? And then you're already doing it, right? I'm you're doing go this. camera, but yeah. Uh huh. And we're going bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. So that's one way that I'll draw movement out of people who aren't necessarily movers or choreographers. And then I'll also use certain structured activities that I know will give me the look that I want. 
So one of them is something called body surfing, where people can line up like little logs and like log roll like you did when you were a kid. Uh -huh. And another person can literally lay on them and get moved forward. And we have enough of people doing that, it actually looks like ocean waves. And so I know I'll have that effect. I know I can coach people on how to do that and, they'll, and it'll, it'll get done. And when I have the pleasure of working with actual kind of trained dancers, I will sometimes give them a scientific paper to read, something that's really accessible and has a lot of imagery, and I'll ask them to choreograph 30 seconds of movement, come with it, and we'll adapt it. That's fantastic. This is such an innovative way of thinking about your field, and you're in marine sustainability, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, given the flowing nature of water, it seems like it's sort of a natural fit. How do you kind of turn the tide against that again? How do you get people to kind of come back to this idea that art is important to science and is a valuable part of creating it and expressing it? Well, I want to talk about it, so thank you for this opportunity to talk about <laughs> it. Um, I. If I can engage them in my work, I point to other people's work, I get explicit about what art can bring that are other ways of communicating and engaging is not so readily equipped to bring. I personally think, and I'd love to do the research to back this up, that the movement changes our biochemistry. So I find that I can talk about the extinction of sea turtles, which is really depressing, and people can sit with that topic a lot longer. Uh, there's a joy that comes through moving, and so that joy helps create more space for this heavy topic. And the longer you can sit with a topic that's difficult, the more likely you're gonna to get to solutions. So I talk about that in terms of the meaning and the power of it, and then I do what I just did with you, which is remind you of the history of where we came from as scientists. You look at Leonardo da Vinci, what was he? He was a scientist and an engineer and an artist. Mm -hmm. And it's only recently that we've narrowly defined ourselves, and I think it's to our detriment. Yeah. Dr. Kiki Jenkins, thank you so much for coming in today to talk to us. Thank you for letting me talk about science dance. Yeah. What do voicemails, a climate change course, and the United Nations Conference of Parties all have in common? Professor Laura Gurton joins us here in studio to explain. Talk about a fascinating way to engage your students. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. So I want to talk about the work you're doing with this intersection between arts and sciences. At what point did you realize you were going to need to come up with creative ways of engaging your students and the general public? It was pretty early on when I was teaching. So at my campus within Penn State University, I teach introductory level geoscience courses for non-science majors. And so I'm at the bottom of the priority and to-do list for my students. And so trying to find ways to get them engaged in and out of the classroom and getting them to see the relevance and importance of why geoscience matters to their everyday life, I looked to communications organizations and different strategies to bring that into my classroom to get students involved. Can you talk about some of the strategies that you've used, some of the creative ways that you are, you're trying to get them excited about science? So one of the ways is using projects that involve audio. So for example, this semester I've been doing a voicemail project with my students where they're learning about a particular topic. In my climate class this semester, we've been following the COP conference, the Conference on Parties by United Nations, and looking at those climate discussions and what the pledges are moving forward and having my students actually practice speaking about science through the mode of pretending they're recording a voicemail for someone. So that way it's getting them practicing speaking about the discipline. So they, they, they just record themselves, they pretend it's a voicemail, and what are they trying to convey? What kind of information? So it's not a scientific report. I really want students to be able to develop a narrative and storytelling skills because, again, my students are not going to be future scientists, but they are going to have the ability to make decisions about their lives, their purchasing and where they live, and to be able to share information that they learn. So that's why the voicemail project is so perfect because it allows them to tell a story, share a narrative about a particular geoscience topic. What other creative endeavors have you done over the years? So I've actually brought yarn and fabric into communicating <laughs> geoscience as well. So I've been crocheting temperature scarves and temperature blankets where we look at daily maximum temperature values for a particular location over a year and then have 365 rows that represent temperature difference for a location. I've also been looking at how we can use quilts as a mode to tell stories about science. How are you encouraging your professional colleagues to come up with 
um, creative endeavors as well as a way to reach out to their students and reach out to the general public. The first step is to show them what I've been doing in the classroom to start with because it is a little different than what you would find in a typical science course. But then most importantly is sharing the impact it's having on the students. And we're even seeing students asking instructors in future classes in other disciplines, can I do this type of project? Can I do audio? Can I do something that involves crafting? Which is not something that typically other instructors have done. So the momentum is really coming and is driven by the students. That's great. And what do you, do you have a, a creative ideas for what you're planning to do next? Oh my goodness, so many ideas and not enough time, unfortunately. <laughs> but I do want to continue having students not do these assignments independently, but have it be collaborative and have the group to come together and create it. Because I think those group conversations and collaborations are really going to enhance their skill development and again, building some transferable skills, no matter what discipline they're pursuing, and come up with some really effective communication. Professor Laura Gurton, thank you so much for your time and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Time to head into orbit. At the University of Iowa, TRACERS is part of a larger initiative, NASA's Explorers Program, studying how the sun affects space and the space environment around planets. The University of Iowa has been, you know, in the business of space physics research for as long as that has existed. We're working on a mission called TRACERS, which looks to understand how energy, mass, and momentum coming from the sun connect into near-Earth space. And my part of that is an instrument called MAGIC, which will make very precise measurements of the magnetic field, which is basically steering and controlling that connection. TRACERS is a NASA SMEX mission, or Small Explorer mission. It's a two-satellite mission, and they're going to a region of the Earth called the CUSP. In that region, a process that we know about called magnetic reconnection shoots a burst of particles that come down along the Earth's magnetic field. The main question that we're really interested in is this, is reconnection purely a time-varying phenomenon? If it's just spatial, if I fly through with a second satellite, everything should be exactly in the same place. Our next guest here in studio believes music can be used to change the emotional climate about climate change. Dr. Lucy Jones created Tempo to bring the scientific and artistic communities together to explore ways to create music to inspire action. She's here now to explain. What a fascinating concept. Thanks so much for coming in to talk to us. Oh, thanks for having me here. Tell me about the Tempo project. It sounds so cool. It is. It's, I've had the greatest time. It's a place where we're bringing together climate scientists who understand what needs to be done to address the crisis with social scientists who understand the psychological barriers that are keeping us from acting, with musicians who know how to evoke emotion. Uh, and our goal is to create music, use the power of music to change the emotional climate about climate change. Nice. How did you come up with this idea? I came to see that what's coming from climate change is so much worse than anything that an earthquake could do. I really can't justify promoting a lot of earthquake safety measures if we won't deal with climate change. So the whole disaster process was moving me there. I spent a lot of time through that working with the psychologists in risk perception, starting to really understand what are drivers, how do you communicate about risk in a way that actually leads to action. And I'm a musician. It's a lot about data awareness. And the problem is data awareness doesn't lead to action. In fact, data awareness on the climate problem can lead to fear. Now, fear is a really good short-term motivator. <laughs> We're evolved to you know, learn to run away from the predator. But if it's a long-term problem with no short-term solution, and the only way you can stop being afraid is to not think about it. And so the more fear we get about climate change, actually we can be seeing an increase in denialism because it's the only way to cope with the fear. And, and sort of that awareness and that place to coming, how do we do this in a way, let's bring the psychologists in, help us understand which emotions we should be evoking, and how do we create music to do it? So how does bringing music in create the sort of climate to deal with climate change? Pride and hope are some of our most activating emotions. So we need to believe that our actions make a difference. We won't take action if we think it's a waste of time. 
but if we can do it in a group, we feel like we're part of it. That makes us more willing to undertake it. We feel more empowered. We feel uh, uh, everything just becomes more feasible. And music is inherently a place where people come together. You know, when you play music together, you breathe together, obviously, if you're singing, right? You've got to phrase the music. You end up moving together. Your bows are going if you're playing a string instrument. Our brain waves literally line up when we play music together. So musical groups are already a strong community. And, and so there's one place, it's a prime area where we can get this to happen. But we need to be focusing on the type of music that gives us hope, that makes us believe we can make a difference, and that s helps us connect to other people and move forward. This is the stuff that I, I really care about. But we've just recently, and actually because of AGU, finally got some compositions. Fantastic. So we, we've been talking about it, we've been thinking about it, we've had these great composers and, and other musicians, but performers that have been part of this. So what do you hope people are going to take away from this project? People who hear it, people who participate in it? The people who participate, we are, we are trying to create a community. We're also developing resources from, for them, from the psychologist and from the, the physical scientists. Here are actions that will make a difference. How do you undertake this? Here are the emotions we need to be thinking about as we talk about this. Um, and you know, I hope scientists hearing this might be interested. They can, they can sign up through my website to be part of the group and we'll like be able to connect them if we have musicians coming in from the same area. Um, a lot of choirs are now putting on climate concerts. We hope to get them to think about the positive aspects as we do this, but then also connect them with scientists who can create reality. I mean, the science alone isn't the solution, right? The science is necessary but insufficient to move society towards that action. But it is necessary. It's the basis on which we build all of the rest of it, as long as people can understand it. So we're hoping to engage scientists that want to be part of this, that want to work with the artists and musicians. And I think what we add to a very large community that's already doing this is really bringing in the social sciences to understand the direction that we need to. It's not just that we need to tell stories. We need to think about which story we tell. Dr. Lucy Jones, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. Dr. Mika Tosca, an associate professor of climate science at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, sits down with her student to discuss the intersection of art and science. And we were lucky enough to listen in. Let's go. We wanted to think about how we could imagine and build and create and inspire people to create positive futures within the context of the climate crisis, right? And so, uh, one approach to that is utilizing art. Artists can harness human imagination in ways that science currently isn't always able to do. And so this is why specifically we're working on this solar punk project, because you were telling me something about how solar punk is sort of positive versus steampunk, right? Do you want to talk about that? Well, initially, when we were talking about solar punk, a lot of what comes to mind is very visual and aesthetic of like buildings and very landscape and architectural. And so my approach was thinking about materiality and painting things that I could hopefully bring to life that kind of are in line with environment and technology or new innovation and like, how can I paint something so that I can help combat the climate crisis? What's interesting about this project is that how can I translate the scientific knowledge into something that's digestible and feasible for other people to understand and to react to. How can I paint something so beautiful that just makes you want to be a part of where we are and like a part of a future? A future. I focus a lot, you know, thinking about the climate anxieties of my students. How can we build positive futures, no matter if it's a utopia, dystopia, or somewhere in between? If we're able to capture this solar punk ideal or this like positive future after the climate crisis ideal, um, we can make people feel a certain way about it, and I think we can move people to action. At the forefront of art and innovation is always Google, and their partnership and collaboration with NOAA is working to unlock the potential of artificial intelligence to revolutionize the ways in which we analyze and predict weather. As this Center for Satellite Applications and Research is charged with performing calibration and validation of 
all of NOAA's satellite sensors that launch to space and operate on a 24-7 basis. The collaboration with NOAA is really focused around improving the use of satellite observations. It's a research effort to use machine learning to see how well we can improve the way that we use satellite data to help weather forecasts. This collaboration merged basically our physical science expertise in NOAA with the AI expertise of Google. We are providing the seeds for a new system that will be more efficient, that will be inclusive of a lot more satellite data and a lot more environmental data, and therefore would provide better and more comprehensive understanding of the environment. If the AGU scientists advancing Earth and space sciences have one thing in common, it's passion. Today, we asked the attendees about this passion in order to truly uncover why they do what they do. We have a lot of uh, unanswered questions about the moon's interior. Like, for example, we don't know for sure if there is a solid inner core in the moon. Uh, we know uh, something exists like that for the Earth but uh, we still haven't seen any uh, solid signatures related to gravity field or from its rotation yet. Uh, so more precise data will enable us to answer those questions, which are uh, helped to put together the overall uh, uh, history of the Earth-Moon system in general. I'm a storm surge modeler um, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it's going to sound a little cheesy, but what inspires me is that um, I'm making, I feel like, a small difference in the world by modeling um, the extent of inundation in communities and um, helping protect coastal communities from those uh, from the flooding from storm surge. So I love uh, hydrology and hydraulics and this is what I do for a living. People have so many questions about water that hydrology and hydraulics can answer them. It can be as simple as uh, how much uh, water I can get in the next like hundred years or uh, it can be something as complicated as what would be the extent of uh, inundation if, uh, if we expect like a, a hundred year flood. I studied like alkalinity of the ocean and the carbonate system in the ocean and I was alkalinity additions to the ocean and trying to draw down CO2, so CO2 sequestration in that. Given the climate crisis, um, I'm, I'm just passionate about finding ways in which we can try to avoid utter catastrophe. <laughs> for lack of a better term. Well, I work in the biogeosciences and so everything we do is so intimately related to understanding our changing world and what that means for people. So at the end of the day, I'm really motivated understanding the type of world that I'm going to live in and you know, like my nieces and nephews might live in and that we're leaving for others and how we can make sure that that world is you know, the most pleasant and equitable and thriving place to be. And that's a wrap on day three of the AGU 2022 fall meeting. Remember, if you missed any part of today's show, there are plenty of ways to catch up. There will be something for everyone, and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You'll be able to find all the latest episodes and content of AGU TV on the in-house channels of our partner hotels, on our dedicated page on the AGU website, and of course, always on our Twitter and YouTube channels. Plenty of ways to watch. Thanks for joining us today. We will see you right back here tomorrow for more exciting news and highlights from the AGU 2022 Fall Meeting. Have a great one.